In this episode, we are going to be reviewing the Gospel According to St. Matthew from 1964, which was directed by Pier Paolo Pasolini. My guest today is Janine Gilliard, who is a journalist and a longtime correspondent for Fra Noi. And she's a big major Italian film fan. Her blog, Italian Cinema Today, which I found online, which she started in 2005. Janine, thanks so much. I'm glad that you, I finally got you on here. Thank you. <laughs> it's great to be here. I've been enjoying your discovery of Italian cinema this year. <laughs> oh, no, great. thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's as we said before we started, uh, I've, I've always been a, a fan, but it's this endless, you know, pool of movies that I'm still mm -hmm. discovering. And I've always loved Pasolini, Acatone and Mama Roma. Mm -hmm. This, uh, the Gospel According to St. Matthew, I haven't seen before. But just before we jump into that, uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious, when did your exposure to Italian film start? Okay. Um... Well, my family is Italian American, so I grew up with, you know, um, Sofia Loren and Marcello Mastroianni as like part of the extended family. So that's that was always what I considered Italian cinema. Um, and then in 1996, I was working as a video editor for um, CNN in San Francisco, and I was sent to the Rome Bureau because they needed someone, and I heard they needed someone, and I volunteered right away. I said, I'll go. So um, I went there, wouldn't, and right? <laughs> I didn't know what to expect because I had never been to Italy. And with all of my origins in Italy, of course, you know, I was, I was really excited about going. And so um, when I got there, I found that it really wasn't the old world, you know, as we always thought it was like very modern and bustling and contemporary. Right. And um, I spent six months there and I really was immersed in the culture. Six months, I was living in a neighborhood. Um, you know, I was taking the bus to work every day. I experienced, you know, all of the um, strikes and, and everything, you know, mm. that went with um, Italian daily life. So when I got back after spending six months there, I felt a really um, intense void. Um, I was just walking around the streets of San Francisco aimlessly, just wanting to connect, you know, with what I had just left. And um, I spent a lot of time in the North Beach area, Little Italy. And then um, I, I thought cinema, well, maybe I can, you know, see some new movies that were being made there. And so then that's when I discovered Lena Wertmuller, um, right. Nani Moratti, um, you know, Carlo Verdone, and, you know, all of these, these kind of 80s and 90s. Um, yeah. people. And um, then in 2001, when I was living in New York City, I discovered a film festival at Lincoln Center called Open Roads New Italian Cinema. I lived in the neighborhood and I saw these posters all over saying New Italian Cinema. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? So I went to that and I was really blown away because those were the the new, the new cinema, the new filmmakers, um, the people who are my age, you know, my peers, um, Alessandro Piva and um, Gabriele Muccino and all these people who are making these unbelievable films that you know, we're not coming to America. So um, that's when I started writing a couple of years later, I started writing about it because I was just so, I was so into these new movies because they really reflected contemporary Italy, the sights, the sounds, the situations. And so um, I sent a couple articles to Fra Noi and they, they liked the articles and they took me on and gave me uh, my own column. So that was um, December of 2004. I started writing about it. And then um, I started the blog later because all, all these films were being made available, you know, through videos, and I could only, um, I was limited to one article a month with Fra Noi because it was a monthly column. So then that's why I started the blog, because I was able to, you know, put five articles, you know, right. a month rather than just <laughs> one. And then with Facebook, you know, because Facebook wasn't around in 2004 when I started writing for Fra Noi, then Facebook came around and all of these, these young filmmakers were on Facebook. And so I was writing to them privately, like, could I do oh. an interview with you? Yeah, so that was a, that was a huge 
um, part of it. And then it just, you know, it just evolved from there. I've gone to film festivals. And um, so I started, you know, Italian cinema today because I wanted to talk about the new Italian filmmakers. I didn't want to talk, I love, you know, the old cinema, but I thought that that had its share, you, yeah. know, you know, of publicity. I wanted to talk about the new people, the young people who weren't really getting as much, um, as much publicity as they should be getting. And these films were still really unseen because there weren't that many film festivals yet. There was just open roads. And then, you know, one or two films would make it here and get, you know, a release, a, you know, stateside release, but there weren't many. Mm -hmm. So then, um, you know, with more film festivals coming, word started getting out about Italian cinema. And now, I mean, there's, you know, there's a, there's so many bloggers writing about it, new Italian cinema now. Yeah. Um, there's film festivals all over the country that are also um, streaming online. So a lot of people have really, um, you know, caught on to it. But what happened with the old cinema in the last year with all this pandemic stuff, I don't know, I just got into the old cinema because so mm. much is available on Amazon and Criterion channels, yeah. and even yeah. Netflix. Yeah. And um, I had never seen these films of the 1950s, like the Com Commedia Italiana. I saw a couple, right. but you know, Alberto Sordi, all the films that he made during that time, and Franca Valeri. She lived to be 100. She just passed away last year after her 100th birthday. Right. Um, I read I mean, that on your blog. Yeah, there's so many um, of these people that I'm still, you know, discovering. Um, and what's interesting is that I have found their relevance today and yes. a lot of the filmmakers because a lot of the filmmakers that I've interviewed through the years you know I've, I've asked them well what do you think about the old Italian cinema and some of them say well you know it's it's gone that's another era you know this is another time but then there's others who really are um, influenced by it oh, and yeah. I think Paolo Sorrentino is you know a great example of that I mean he's yeah, very, oh, yeah. very influenced by um, Fellini. Yeah. I, mean, I remember so when important. I spoke to uh, Joe he said that to mm -hmm. both mutually know yeah yeah he said, yeah he said, he's uh, great yeah he said uh, he said the same thing and um that kind of led to the documentaries i made last year or the last couple of years when i was telling you explore lucania um talks about the socioeconomic development of basilicata from you know the early ninth the early 20th century um to the present so it's mm. through cinema so as i was saying before that we talk about the films of Luigi Di Gianni, and it's kind of what you see in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, that kind of um, poverty and that kind of, um, because he he filmed in the 60s in Basilicata. And then we, the, the documentary um, ends now, um, you know, present day and in the evolution of that of that region and how, you know, it's become, you know, the, the 2000, I think 18, 19 um, capital of culture, European capital of culture. And then it was one of the five places um, by the New York Times to travel. We interviewed so many, so many amazing people and a lot of people were from this, uh, you know, classic yeah. period, uh, including yeah. the star of this film. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked, I liked that interview where he where he talks about how people were telling him not to smoke because Jesus yeah. put that, because Jesus yeah. wouldn't smoke and he passed away recently right yeah well um I had I had written to him because we, we were friends on Facebook talk about Facebook <clears throat> so I sent him a message and I asked him um if we could do an interview because I wanted to, to talk about this film for Easter it was like during Lent and he said well why don't we do a Skype interview and I was like, okay. And so I, I don't know much about Skype, but um, the connection was terrible. So you yeah. can't really see him that well, but you could hear him. And we did it in Italian. And um, but he speaks great Italian. He was Spanish, but he speaks great Italian. And he died a couple months later. He passed away. Oh, I think he, no. had heart, he had a heart attack. He had some heart trouble. Oh. He was in the hospital. And he passed away. So I believe my interview was the last interview I did with him. Oh, wow. But he was so wonderful. He was just loved talking about it. You know, he loved Elsa Modan. Yeah. Was a, you, you know, a writer. You can feel that he, yeah. he loved it. He was like a Spanish, he was a student when he when he was in the movie, but he was a communist. And I think that's probably how I knew Pasolini. Right. He he like met Pasolini at a party or something. Yeah. And I guess he walked in the door, Pasolini looked at him and he said, There's my there's my Christ. Yeah, I read yeah. that. Yeah. I read that because because 
uh, I, I know we'll, we'll go into a lot of the actors in this, but I mean, everybody he used were people in the communities and uh, mm -hmm. all the uh, agriculture workers and the peasants. And, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's incredible what he was able to achieve with people who weren't actors. Mm -hmm. uh, but before, before I ask you about that, uh, do you remember the first time you saw this film? Was that, was it, just in the last few years, as you said, you were going back to a lot of the classic films. Yeah, um, Pasolini was, I call him my first love of Italian cinema. I mean, I just loved his work. And I felt that when I, when I came back from Rome um, in 96, I saw his films too. And I had lived when I was there in a neighborhood um, that was pretty far out. It was called San Paolo. And it was, you have to take two buses and a train to get there. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I loved it. I loved living out in the suburbs, you know. Right. Um, I really got this experience, you know, suburban life in, in Italy. And um, it was kind of like his films. There was that, that, that um, at, the same atmosphere. Um, Cause it wasn't like the center where everyone was, you know, you know, beautiful and perfect. Right. And um, there was art all over the place. It was, you know, kind of old, I was with the slums or anything, but it was, you know, older and people dressed more normal and, you know, they were heavy, they were thin, they were this, they were that. It was, you know, actual, you know, Roman life. Um, and when I saw this, um, Uccelli Uccellini um, with Toto. That film, when I, that was one of the first films I saw when, you know, I got back and it just, I just fell in love with his filmmaking after that. And then yeah. Acapone and, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, Mama Roma and all those films, they all kind of, they're so, there's such a contemporary feeling to them, you know, yeah. I mean, they're black and white, they were made in the, you know, the sixties, but there's just a feeling, a timeless feeling to them. So, um, yeah, so that's I, I saw I saw this film during that time, and I honestly I didn't connect with it as much because right. um, it wasn't shot in Rome. I was really looking for the Roman aspect. I saw it again recently after um, being in Basilicata because I did my genealogy search in two thousand one after nine eleven. That's a whole other story. I lived. Um, in New York City, was an editor during 9-11. So that wow. experience being there um, inspired me to do what I always wanted to do is find my family in Italy. Because right. it was something I had always procrastinated. I just put off. And, you know, when you, you're in a situation where you, you're here one day and gone the next, you know, mm -hmm. so many people around us were, were gone. I said, yeah. I'm going to do this. I always wanted to do it. So that was 2001. And then I, I found them right away. And then I went to go meet them in 2002. And then that's when I really started learning about Basilicata, the region of mm -hmm. Basilicata. Cause I went there and I spent like three months and I just fell in love with that region. Yeah. It really felt like, I always felt like Rome was my home. It was then when I went down to Basilicata and I'm like, these are my people. I mean, right. they're, all my, they're all short like me. I mean, there's a couple tall people, but there's all like, <laughs> there's this, <laughs> there's a few, a few lucky all ones. All of us Southerners are pretty short. So then I saw it again and then I just realized the beauty of it. You yeah. know, we've all seen the Bible stories, but just the landscapes of Basilicata was, was really striking to me. I thought this was incredible. And as you mm -hmm. said, it, it, it doesn't feel like the, the Cecil B. DeMille right. biblical stories or even like the Michelangelo and Michelangelo the sculptures mm -hmm. uh, of like this and, and a lot of the paintings we know where this guy was like, you know shredded with abs and long mm. beautiful hair and the beard and the blue eyes very mm. much like the actor in the 1977 miniseries the he looks you know his hair is pretty short he's very thin mm -hmm. and um he doesn't even have that beard i mean he's unshaven mm -hmm. but he's got a, a bit of a beard he certainly has a resemblance to the mm -hmm. christ that that we know but as we said with the casting i mean everybody uh no one, no one looks glamorous. Everyone mm -hmm. looks, as we were saying, they look ordinary. They look like people right. you that you would encounter any anywhere. And mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was extraordinary. Even the angel, the the young girl, like mm -hmm. she's not like as we saw see in a lot of movies, like mm -hmm. beautiful blonde angel. Uh, mm -hmm. Like she just like she's like you know she's pretty, but she looks very like an ordinary girl that you meet anywhere. She doesn't have this like quote unquote, angelic quality. Uh, mm -hmm. So 
I thought it was fascinating how he used these people who weren't actors because as we were discussing before we recorded, they, they dubbed everything mm -hmm. in Italy and they didn't even shoot with sound. And I thought he got them to a point where they just had to be there mm -hmm. and be, don't do anything. And their presence alone spoke volumes. Like right off the top, he starts with this incredible close-up of the, the young Mary and then cutting back and forth to Joseph. And it's so intimate. It's mm -hmm. right on their faces. And he hangs with the, the music was incredible How are as you well. <laughs> yeah. And then I love that. He's looking and then they they go to a, a, a they go to a wider shot and you see that she's pregnant and then the angel appears mm -hmm. of course yeah. to say wow okay <laughs> <laughs> right. i it's, love uh, that yeah it's, it, it's funny because joseph's baffled you know like what like, <laughs> like i have to go for a walk i need yeah. to get out of here yeah. i need to clear my head yeah no, well it's there's, so fascinating. there's a lot there's a lot um you brought up in, in that commentary um first of all Pasolini was an atheist. Yeah, well, that's um, another thing. Okay. Yeah, he was a communist oh. and an atheist. Um, yeah. And he was called on by the Pope, Pope John Paul the Twenty Third, I think. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to go to Assisi. Did you hear the story? He was called to go to yeah. Assisi. Um, and there was traffic there because of the papal, all the papal um, confusion. There was, there was a big traffic jam. So Pasolini ended up getting stuck in his hotel and he read the entire Bible. He read all of the, um, you know, all the, the books of the Bible. And when he got to the gospel according to St. Matthew, he felt like he needed to interpret that. He needed to make a movie out of out of these one of these gospels and he chose that one because he felt that was the most humble that was the most um realistic um and that's the reason why there's not a lot of dialogue in the film yeah. because he didn't want to interpret it he said that he was making a film about not just about what happened but about two thousand years mm -hmm. of interpretation of it so he just wanted to to leave it with it with its um you know the, the mystic qualities of the 2000 years of interpretation but he didn't want to put his own interpretation into it and so in an interview someone said well how can you as a non-believer make this um this film about you know christ and then pasolini said you know not quoting exactly if you call me a non-believer you know more about me than i know about myself because he said that he was um nostalgic about the possibility of being a believer and non-believer right so he um was exploring you know his beliefs himself through this film um as far as the people all of the the people who were in it were non-professional actors that kind of speaks to the style of neorealism yes um, yeah this film is not a neorealism film it's not a neorealistic film because those films were made in a very specific period um, you know, between 1943 and, you know, the very right. early 50s, um, because Chinachita was, you know, damaged, so they weren't able to, to work in Chinachita. And also, those neorealistic films were very specifically to mirror the struggles that Italians were going through in the wake of the war and the poverty and the structures, you know, yeah. um, being demolished and everything. Right. So that very was, much about what was happening at yeah, that time. Yeah. But he, um, the, this film, Pasolini's film, has neorealistic elements to it. Yeah, the style, it's, particularly. Yeah, yeah there's the no documentary like, stage. Right. Yeah, and, um, you know, everything is shot, you know, on location. And also the, the fact that practically none of these actors were, you know, I don't think any of them were really um, professionals. No, I, I don't think, think a so. A couple of them went on to maybe work in other Pasolini films. And there yeah. was one who worked in um, the, the character of James. That actor went on to work in Juliet of the Spirits. He had like a small part. Um, I think that the, of, of everything, um, that was professional, non-professional. The most moving part is the music. Is oh the yeah. Oh my um, God. I I've, had, I've had that in my head actually. Louis Bakalov. Now yes. I actually wrote down some, some notes on him because he used 
um, songs by Odetta Holmes, yeah. who is an American singer, act, actress, guitarist, lyricist, and civil rights and human active, civil and human rights activist. And then Blind mm. Willie Johnson, who is an American gospel blues singer. And you, I mean, that music is so strong. Oh my God, and yeah. Something with him is that um, he, he had also, a real talent with music. Like and yeah. they, they seem to like contrast what's happening in a way, but yet it works. Like you know when when he puts Odetta's song uh, plays that song for example. Uh, sometimes I feel like a motherless child, but he puts it on when they're all there to celebrate the birth of Christ, which goes mm -hmm. against the lyrics, but yet it mm -hmm. fits so beautifully. I don't know if you know as to why he chose that. I don't know, but it works for me. But I think it's interesting because that precedes. Um the scene when they come and get all the children. Oh, that's right, the yeah. baby. So I'm wondering if it had yeah, anything to do with possibly. that. Possibly, yeah, that, that yeah. scene is so brutal. Oh, um, it's, it's brutal in every interpretation, but yeah. I mean, this one, because it really is so real, it's brutal there. Oh my but, God, um, yeah. Louis Sabakalov actually worked with um, Sergio, Corbu Sergio Corbucci on um, Django. Django and then oh, right. I think it was made in 1966. A couple of years and later. Then, yeah. And then um he in, in the Django Unchained with uh, Tarantino, Tarantino yeah. he did the music uh, for that as well. And yeah. he just passed away in 2017. So he's another one who continued to stay relevant. Oh, wow. He also yeah. did the Il Postino soundtrack. Oh no way. Yeah, which was beautiful. Wow. Yeah. I yeah, the music in this just blew me away, particularly towards the end when after he's crucified and put in the tomb and then as he resurrects and the, the stone comes down and the music comes right at that point. And I, I, I'm not sure which song that was. I don't know if you would know offhand, um, but the song, it just sort of, it had this celebratory feel, you know, it was so like, it almost made you, it almost put an energy through me, <laughs> borderline wanting to dance or something like, or chant. Like I just thought, that was just perfect. I mean, his use of music at the right moments. I mean, I know, uh, you know, Scorsese has that talent as well and uh, Kubrick and uh, um, so many filmmakers, but I don't think people people think about Pasolina in that way because I thought his mus use of music was always amazing mm -hmm. and not, mm -hmm. not obvious as well. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think it also had a lot to do with the composer. Just she, she chose those songs. I mean, yeah, he was that's a true. He arranged it also, and yeah. he also did um, Fellini City of Women. So he oh, stayed yeah. there with Italian cinema. Yeah. There were a lot of um, parallels with Fellini and Pasolini. I mean, I'll, I'll also if their styles of filmmaking were very different, Pasolini um, wrote for Fellini, and I think he worked on La Strada and Knights of Cabaria because he that's right that's right he knew the um the dialect of the romans so um he helped you know with writing those screenplays and there's mm -hmm. some really beautiful pictures some really beautiful photographs of pasolini and um fellini you know when people think why would a why would a marxist non-believer openly mm -hmm. gay man make up the story of christ but if you look at this story the story of people mm -hmm. um describe it very in a very sentimental idealistic mm -hmm. way and he really, to me, showed Je what Jesus really was. Like he was a revolutionist, mm -hmm. that he hated mm -hmm. money, hated people who were after money. Uh, all they cared yeah, about was money. And mm -hmm. he was angry. This is an angry <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> he was like a union leader, you know, the way he would debate, the way he would, uh, he would call people out on their hypocrisy. He was condescending. He was dismissive. Mm -hmm. I mean, when he was talking to those high priests and they're challenging him and he would challenge them back often with mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they took him for granted, I think. I don't think they realized how smart he was. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, he, I mean, he, he was openly going against their, their laws and their traditions and showing them how hypocritical they were. And, mm -hmm. uh, of course... People wanted to do away with him because they were, I think ultimately they were afraid of him, like mm -hmm. any other figure who's a re been a revolutionist ever since Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X, you know, so many people over the years who will die for their causes. Uh, I think it, it brought it, I think he really brings it back to what Jesus was about, which was, mm -hmm. okay, 
you know, why don't we, let's forgive each other. Let's love each other. Let's not be so, so concerned with money. Let's, why don't we, why don't we focus on the present mm-hmm. today in this moment? And why don't we have faith, you know? And I'm like, you know what? This is still so relevant because mm-hmm. we're still in a society mm-hmm. that, that often, most of the time is mainly impressed with money. Yeah, and more than ever. Exactly. And value others, not on who they are, but what they have. And mm-hmm. that's what he hated. And mm-hmm. a lot of the other biblical films or stories I've seen, and I, I could be totally wrong because I'm not an expert on the films on Jesus, but you only saw him angry at that money lending scene, you know, mm-hmm. when you take the money and throw it. Mm-hmm. And he's usually very calm, very quiet. In this film, he's, 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 he's so, he's very an angry guy. He's angry because of what he's seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, but also he was flawed too. I mean, there were some aspects of vanity. I felt like he was, you know, because of his miracles, he wanted that one scene where he shows up in that village. He's like, why is no one praising me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. or uh, or he contradicted because it's okay to die for him to give your life for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> to be and, rewarded. Yeah, yeah, things like that, which I thought okay, and 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 contradicting himself. Well, I'm not here to bring peace. I'm here to take up the sword. But later mm-hmm. on, he was mm-hmm. totally against. You know, you saw when they came to arrest him. He told everyone, "Don't be violent. Don't do anything." Mm-hmm. And I like how much they show of everybody else, and and him included to an extent, only towards the end when, of course, the famous scene uh, where he's asking God not to let this happen, when he starts to get afraid the night before he's going to be arrested. But you see his God, the uh, apostles, the uh, how they they lack courage. And he said, you will lack courage and you will fall apart. You will run away. You will deny you know me. And Judas, mm-hmm. of course, you know, sells him out again, what, for money and then ultimately hangs himself and I just I, I forget how off how relevant this story is and a lot of things you, you know when they when they see particularly as you said earlier now more than ever we we see often people saying they're religious but yet don't do anything Jesus says and mm-hmm. I see so often on the internet when people compare that to Jesus like do people remember Jesus was basically <laughs> <laughs> you know but yet if there was if, if, if he existed today people who who say that they're christian or, or catholic i'm not saying everybody but often the kid yeah. they would hate him you know mm-hmm. they would do away with him they'd call him a bum which is what happened to him at that time you know i was fascinated by that i i haven't seen a better portrayal i don't know if, how you could compare that with like mm-hmm. other films on jesus that you've seen yeah, well, I grew up watching those films, you know, the, the Ten Commandments and all those those um, biblical films. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This one is so much more, um, it's just so real. And yeah, exactly. I, yeah. Yeah, and um, I also appreciate the non-actors, mm-hmm. um, you mm-hmm. know, the non-professional actors who were in it. Um, I think that they give a sense of authenticity. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it was it was nominated for an Oscar for a costume. And um, when when Pasolini was creating the look of Christ, he um, referenced art, Byzantine art. So that's kind of why he has that, you know, those eyebrows and he's got that simple look. He was going for, um, you know, a Byzantine, more of a Byzantine look um, mm-hmm. rather than, you know, traditional, like those, those elaborate, you know, costumes that we had seen in, in other yeah. films. Yeah, no, it's, it's so, you know, it's bare it's bones very filmmaking. It's yeah, it's very, even wa- that scene where he walks on water. I mean, it's mm-hmm. not what you saw in the other films. It's just, it just kind of is what it is. You see him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I love when the other guy, he tells him to join him. And then he thinks he's falling. And then he says, don't you have any faith? And mm-hmm. um, I thought that was so interesting because I think his, his teachings, whether you're a believer or not, I mean, his, his teachings are so beneficial to anyone's life uh, yeah. in the here in the in the here and now. Um, I also thought it was interesting that when it came time for the crucifixion and the torture, of course, and you know, we saw the Pat the Pat Mel Gibson, yeah, sure. which was also of, filmed there. Was also I read filmed. that this morning. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't. He he. Perhaps it didn't interest him, but there's hardly even any blood on him. I mean, I don't think that was necessarily because this was in the mid sixties. I don't think Pasolini would have censored it. I'm not, I mean, maybe that is why, but 
Um, it's not very violent. It's not very bloody. I mean, did you, is that something that mm -hmm. you felt? Um, you, I, you know, I just, noticed, I, or? I just owe that to the um, style of Pasolini. I mean, what he wanted to do. I don't think he felt that he needed a, to yeah. see that gore and you know blood like we saw. I mean, feeling the atmosphere of the film, and I and you know, I think that's all of Pasolini's films. They yeah. all have that sense of simplicity and the atmosphere. That's, There's yeah. like a peaceful atmosphere to them. I mean, even Mama Roma for for everything that she was going through. There's those silences. There's so much that, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ettore says with his eyes. And yeah. um, there was a lot of that in this film too. And oh, I don't yeah. know if that's yeah. because of, you know, this one, they were non-professional. So he didn't really want to give them, you know. Well, lines. that's what I, I thought. Yeah, because even, even when he gets arrested at the trial, I mean, there's, there's a lot more dialogue there mm -hmm. and you know it's again it was all dubbed but Dub, yeah i don't know if he intentionally because he was shooting from the pov of the apostles mm -hmm. so it's further back i don't mm -hmm. i think it worked to his benefit because it gave for me it gave the feeling of how they were helpless they couldn't help mm -hmm. it so it's mm -hmm. further back and you know you see them losing their courage and um he didn't have to go in close he could just dub it later with some you know, it's, it's done so, so briefly, like, oh, but you're blasphemy, then you're dead, you know? Right, and think about the use of non-professional actors there. I mean, they probably did feel helpless. I mean, they yeah. didn't know what to do, rather <laughs> than an actor who's going to say, okay, I'm going to act like I'm helpless, you of know? Of course, yeah. I mean, they, and all of the, all of the extras were, you know, from Matera yeah. or from Barile, yeah. they were from all of the, you know, they were from, Puglia, I guess he got a couple, and then Calabria. So these were all like peasants, you yeah. know, who made yeah. a little extra money working on the film. And yeah. um, I used had them so well. I mean, I just thought... I, I think that the 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 most striking part for me, as far as you know, the acting, you know, the acting was um, you know amazing with these these non professionals and the presence of um, Erasiqui was where it was shot. I mean, just. The, the Matera and Barile and those those wine cantinas. I mean, I had I had talked about that with you, and I wanted to. I printed part of this interview that I did um, with Daniele Bracuto, who is um, he was the president of the Barile Cineform um, that was dedicated to Pasolini. So he was kind of a a Pasolini, um, you know, expert from the area. I asked him what qualities of Basilicata attracted Pasolini to the region, and he said it was the purity of the landscapes. That's what I wondered um, myself. Yeah, the roughness of the structures and the yeah. authenticity of the people. Right. Now, just that line alone, all of that comes through in the film. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. The film has has a. I mean, look at the 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 Mary. She's got you know she's total. She's the essence of purity. Yeah. And yeah. then his mother in the film, she she has the sense of purity in the way she reacted to you know her son being crucified um just that strong sense of sadness yeah. and yeah. Pasolini said that she called on how she felt when her son you know his brother was was killed in the morning that she went through over that so I mean there's a lot of authenticity in this yeah. film I mean, you could you could walk in, you could go to Basilicata, and you're going to see exactly those um, structures there uh, today. Yeah, it's incredible. So I don't think he yeah. put a lot into that. No, no, you know? he just shot it straight. He just, mean, yeah, it was just... more, you know, it was more just the human, the, like you, you mentioned, just the human aspect of Jesus about how he was, you know, so human. He wasn't perfect. He had flaws. He had a temper. Absolutely. You know, he didn't have a lot yeah. of patience. Um, but he was very, you know, he was very passionate about his cause, you know? Oh, yeah, he, yeah. He, he hated, um, like you said, he hated the the money and the, um, false people, and he, that came through. He's and very, he is Pasolini. Pasolini is him in a way. <laughs> I think Pasolini shared a lot of, a oh, lot of yeah. those traits. Yeah. yeah. I'm, you know, people want to share. When he was in that hotel, you know, in Assisi reading the Bible and yeah. reading the Gospels, I think he's like, oh my God, my, oh my God, not to, no pun intended. I really, <laughs> uh, I connect with this person that I, I so, think so. I know, think so. I don't believe him. Yeah. And you know, you know, a lot of these labels get thrown around socialist, Marxist, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, even in the IMDb description, it's like, oh, he portrayed him as a Marxist. And I'm like, yeah, but I mean, 
you know, when people hear those kind of labels, they 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 dismiss it. It's like he's not. Yeah. It's not. It's not like a left or right cause. I mean, what he's saying just it's just about living. It makes sense. It's like okay, mm-hmm. well, maybe we should. Maybe we should see more about our own self worth and what's <laughs> you know, and then and, and the people. What can we do for our fellow neighbors and. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's not like he was saying talking budgets or, or mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, lesson from it. Which yeah. version did you see? Did you see the dubbed version in English or subtitle? No, no, I saw the subtitle that I read. Of course, last night this was colorized and then cut. Like forty minutes of it was cut. So I imagine that's a terrible version. You saw a colorized version? There apparently there is. Oh. There's a color. It was uh, uh, there's a colorized version of oh this. Oh my gosh, I never saw that. Yeah, um, that, and I they cut it. Them. But I, I saw the du- I saw the Italian one. Yeah, yeah. That you see the version on Vimeo. There's a version on Vimeo, and it's dubbed. Okay, I think that everyone should see this version because you can pay if you speak English. You can pay attention to the film more. And also, the subtitles in Pasolini's film are written very strangely. It's they're very not, po- poetic, yeah. Sometimes yeah, it's hard not, to make sense of what he was saying. Yeah, they're also yeah. They're almost like the Bible, like, you yeah, know, the exactly. the different way of speaking. Right. But the dubbed version, I mean, I, I, never liked, I never liked to watch dubbed versions of anything, but this is different because, yeah. I mean, the original was dubbed anyway. But it's easier to understand, even if you just watch it like once, you know, maybe watch it the very first time you see the movie, then you could see the background, you could pay attention to like the locations and the expressions with Jesus. And because, you know, when I was reading the subtitles, I wasn't paying attention to Jesus' expressions. And so I wasn't getting all the anger. Yeah, I had to pause it a few times just because some, it was a little, some of the wording was a little confusing. confusing. Watch that version, you know. I didn't know there was an English one. Okay, so I'll have to check that out. I'll send you, um, I'll send you the link. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, please do. Yeah, because, you know, I've watched the one on Amazon. I have, um, I have a DVD somewhere. I, ha- I brought everything. I have yeah. a DVD. So, um, the, but the DVD also had, that was like the very first version I watched before it was streaming. And yeah, it has those weird subtitles. Um, but I would check out the one on Vimeo. Just okay. it makes it a little more easy to comprehend. Okay, yeah, no, I'm There's a lot to take out. in. There's a lot yeah, to take in. Yeah, it is, it is. Film. It's an a intense lot. film. Yeah. It's, it's a, it certainly is an intense film, but I, I gotta thank you again for suggesting it because I really loved it. I thought it was, wow, it was so powerful. I'm so glad. I, 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 like I said, I'm enjoying your discovery of Italian cinema. <laughs> thank <year>. you. <laughs> you're, you're like a kid in a candy store. You're no, like, I am. I, I, I'm seeing so much and there's so many more that I want to see, but I think everybody, it, you know, and it, it's not like, a, I, don't, I don't feel this is a religious film in the sense mm-hmm. that, well, I'm Christian and I'm Catholic and it's Easter, so let's put it on. I really think this is for everybody because Mm -hmm. um, whether you're a believer or not believer or agnostic or atheist or whatever, Mm -hmm. it's really just about um, a way to live. I mean, it's such a relevant story. Um, And I don't think people think about Jesus in that way anymore. It's Mm -hmm. just, it's just been, you know, it's just been mythology. What's the word I'm looking for? Mythology? Is that a word? Mythologized? Mythologized. No. <laughs> Something along those lines. Uh, uh, way too much. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, well, no, that's thank- what he said he wanted to do, though. He wanted to bring that 2,000 years of interpretation. Exactly. Into yeah. This film. Yeah. No, I so, think it, it holds up, you know, six, almost six, 57 years later beautifully. Yeah. I just want to plug this Radio Volt, Volt today. Volt today is. Um, Rio Nero and Volta today is right next to Buddy Lay where, where it was filmed. So this is all the same land. So if people ever want to connect with that, there's a radio show that once in a while I do, I contribute to, I do a report for. It's called um, Radio Volta today. And you can find it on Mixcloud. And it's just like, um, it's live every Sunday morning at like four o'clock in the morning, Eastern time, because it's 10 in the morning there. Yeah. But it's broadcast live, you know, from, from that region, from, you know, Pasolini's oh, wow. stomping grounds while he made this. And um, they they have it live with a video and then they archive it on Mixcloud. So if anyone wants to listen okay, to great. it, just go to Mixcloud and um, put Radio Voltaire in. The accent okay. is on the U. They always make fun of me because I say it well today, but it's Radio <laughs> Vult today. <laughs> so, 
So I'm okay, going to the listeners if they want to do that. Well, yeah, I'll leave the link in the description box below okay, for you that. Of course, uh, your fantastic blog, which I frequent uh, fre frequently check out. And it's uh, fantastic if anyone just wants to know about not only the history of cinema, but so much of modern cinema of today, which as my talk with Joe in the last 30 or more years, we, we don't even hear about that mm -hmm. many Italian movies like they used to in the 50s and 60s where it was so international. So I'll leave that below. Uh, Janine, thanks again for coming okay. on. I'm really glad that we finally Thank got the chance to talk. Me. Yeah, Thank no, it was, a, it was a blast. And thanks again for uh, okay. suggesting this film because I really enjoyed it. Hey, I'm so happy. Yeah, okay. no, me too. And I also have a Patreon membership if anyone is interested in becoming a member where there's bonus content there created by me. The link is in the description box below for that. And there's also an audio version of this podcast, which doesn't have everything that's on the YouTube channel. But if you're on the go and just want to listen, it's on any of the audio platforms, Apple, Spotify, places like that. If this is your uh, first time on my YouTube channel, please consider subscribing. Uh, it's free to do so by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You'll see it floating above my head right here to your top left. In just a second, just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release a new video or go live. And thanks again so much, Janine. And we will see everyone in the next episode.